Hi guys, um, this is going to be Revelations. So I did the seals and, and the trumpets, you know, and that got me up to like a Revelations 11. I'm like, okay, let's do 12, right? Which is a super important chapter. But um, I skipped over Revelations chapters 1, 2, and 3 because... The seals and the, and the trumpets is kind of where we're at, or we're at the precipice right before it. You know, I don't know ex exactly. You know, I'm not setting dates. Uh, all I'm looking is at the signs of the times and what's happening, the season we're in, you know, and I know we're close. And I can feel it that... It's about to break loose. When? I don't know. It's his timing, not my timing. You know, sometimes I get anxious and it's like, well, let's do it now. And it's like, but it's not the right time, you know. And later on, I'm like, okay, I, I understand why, you know, the patience. Um, so I'm coming back to Revela Revelations chapter 1, 2, and 3. There's three chapters. And so each chapter is one third, right? And so then I'm like, why is it one third? And why is that so important? Um, well, there's a Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, right? Um, and then he showed me the number 31. And I kept seeing it everywhere, 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 you know? And then... I realize that everything God does, Satan wants to mimic or destroy or to tear down. So I'm, in, you know, speaking English, reading reading things from left to right, but Hebrew is from right to left. So then I'm going, okay, he shows me 31, but really it means 13. And then I'm thinking, okay, you know, and I've heard, and I saw this, I checked it out, you know, Genesis chapter 13 was the rebellion. Um, the first time it's mentioned, and so it's 13, like Friday the 13th, oh, it's a bad day and bad omen and bad things happen, you know, and they say the plagues of Egypt happen on Friday the 13th, you know, um, I think it was the death of the firstborn, don't quote me on it, I, I think this is what I, I read, you know. And then I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, uh, was it 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the whole love chapter? So I'm thinking, okay, so God has set up his festivals, his feasts, and like the, uh, the winter feast, the feast of dedication, the one where Jesus went in the midst, you know, he sent everybody ahead, and then he came in the midst of the week, you know, to show up at the fe at the feast. And which feast is that? The feast of uh, tabernacles, Hanukkah, with the menorah, which is kind of relating to the seven churches that we're going to talk about. You know, and I did a thing on seven churches, but this is a little deeper. So there's three chapters, and at first, you know, I was just going to read through it, and then I realized, wait a minute. It's more to this, because each chapter starts out with, this is God, his attributes, how great he is, and his power and authority, and establishing, you know, his greatness, his glory, his holiness, you know. Um, and then I go, okay, there's a middle section, which talks about each one of the churches, and there's seven churches, Um out of three chapters. And then I'm like, okay, seven churches, three chapters, me and numbers, you know, what's three plus seven? Ten. You know, ten is the whole number, which shows one. Okay? Um, God is beginning and the end, right? There's one God in three parts. You know, and then I'm like, okay, what's three times seven? Twenty-one. Okay, how long did Daniel fast for? 21 days. 
but it was said before he started his prayers and supplications, Gabriel the angel was sent out. So God already knew before Daniel started to pray, God's like, he's going to start praying, go Gabriel, right? Which tells you the spiritual side is working before we even know it. God knows what you're going to say before you even say it. What you're going to pray for, what you're going to ask for, what you're going to do. And so, well then, where's the free will? Well, we don't know what's going to happen. Some of us have the gift of prophecy. And they're able to see what's going to happen in the future. You know, but n not everybody. There's gifts given all over the place of different things. Because we're different parts of the same body. So not everybody has it. So we all get bits and pieces. And when we put it all together, somebody has the interpretation and can explain it to you. Okay, that's how God works. You know? The puzzle will be all put together in the end. And then we'll know. Okay, so there's that 21, right? So 3 times 7 is 21. And then I'm like, okay, wait, Hebrew, let's go backwards. Okay, that's 21 backwards is 12. Which, how many apostles? How many prophets? How many sons of Jacob? Okay, see, there's a pattern, 12. How many foundations of the New Jerusalem? Well, okay. And the apostles, 12. So then I'm thinking, hmm, okay. Um, there's a lunar eclipse on 12, 21. Does that mean something? Uh, it's all possible. We'll see. So, and I know that Jesus divides 7 by 3 and 4. So then I thought, okay, there's three chapters. <clears throat> and then I thought, okay, there's three parts, right, to each chapter. The first one, like I said, was giving God glory, attributes, explaining, you know, who he is and what his position is in authority, everything, okay? The next part talks about each church. And the seven angels talk to the seven churches. But as they're talking to them, First, they say, hey, here's God, how great he is. He should always come first, right? Then they talk about the churches. Hey, the good stuff that you've done, right? And then some of the churches are admonished, right? Saying, hey, you're doing great, but there's this one thing you need to work on, right? Because Jesus says that who he loves, he corrects. And Father prunes the bush to create more fruit. So... Then, you know, I see that, hey, here's the bottom part. If you overcome, these are the rewards, the benefits, the glory. That will be given to you by who? By the first part of the chapter, talking about God. But then I see, wait a minute, okay, it's not just three. He's dividing the chapter, not into three parts, but into four. So wait a minute. There's three chapters, and each one of them has four parts. Here's a three divided by four of the seven churches again. Um, so then I'm like, how am I going to be able to explain what I see? So then I took everything out of the three chapters that talks about Jesus. And then I broke it down into parts of all the good stuff that churches are doing. And then here's all the... The next part is the bad stuff, the stuff that you're sinning on, that you need to repent from and go back and work out your salvation with fear and trembling, like uh, uh, Philippians 3, 13, or 3, 1, somewhere there, okay? Um, and then, you know, there's that last part that tells you all the good stuff if you overcome. So then, I want to read the three chapters, but first, I want to read to you the breakdown so that you can see as we go through. Try and get this quick. Um, this is all the parts about Jesus and all the good stuff. He who is and who was and who is to come, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him 
who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He be glory and dominion forever and ever. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and is to come, the Almighty, the one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, girdled about the chest with a gold band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. See, didn't we talk about, you know, the sword thing? Yeah. And his voice, as the sound of many waters, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was like the sun shining at full strength. Super bright, right? He's got legs of brass. His hair is white. His countenance, like how bright he is, so you can't see him because he's so bright, right? But his eyes are like flames in a fire. That would be an awesome sight and a scary sight. And John, yeah, he absolutely got scared. Um, fell down like he was dead before him. Um, let's go on. He says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am, see, he says that here, I am. Well, when Moses went to the tree and he says, the burning bush, right, he's like, well, who shall I say who sent me? He said, tell him I am. When Jesus was confronted in the Garden of Gethsemane, right, and there he says, who are you looking for? Not like Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am. And he said it three times. But when he said it, they fell backwards. Why? Why would they fall backwards? Because the immense power and authority in his word, it cuts like a double-edged sword between the bone and the marrow. Right? So he says here, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. So he's, he's right there. He's saying, I am which is referring to God, the name of God, which is Yah, Yahweh, right? Yahushua means he saves. So in his name, it says God who saves, just like it was in Emmanuel. You know, you will call him Emmanuel. Why? God with man and God saves. Let's go on. So he, he's sitting there saying he lives. He was dead. He died on the cross. Right? But behold, I'm alive. He rose from the dead. That's the gospel right here. This is God saying, I am, and here is my gospel. I lived, I died, I was rose again from the dead. I have the king, the keys of Hades and of death. Meaning he's conquered death. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. He, you know, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Right there. When he says he's Almighty, and he's the Lord, um, and he says, I am, that's in three different ways he's saying, I'm God. But, well, one, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who, uh, who lives and was dead, and behold, I live alive evermore. He repeats the gospel and the good news of him dying and raising from the dead. Says, I have the keys of Hades and of death. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Seven stars in his right hand. Okay. You know, when he separates the wheat from the tares or the goats from the sheep. The good ones go on the right, the bad ones go on the left. What's going on? Who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Think of the menorah. There's three on this side. There's one down the middle and three over here. Yeah, I'm wearing gloves. My hands are cold. Um... That's the menorah. And this is all about, they only had oil enough for one day, you know? 
and it lit for seven. Now, there's three spring feasts, three fall feasts. The one in the middle is Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the apostles. So he walks in the midst of the golden candles, the golden lampstands. These things says the first and the last. He who was dead and came to life. Talking about the gospel again. <clears throat> about the cross. These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like flame of fire and his feet like brass. Yeah, we heard that before, right? And he who sat on the the Roan who sat there was like Jasper and Sardis, stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in the appearance like an emerald. Okay, now I plucked that all out of the three chapters plus the first part of uh, chapter four to, to give an idea of like this is what. God told it to Jesus, and Jesus told it to an angel, and the angel told it to John. Okay, now some people say, well, the Bible isn't real because it was written by men, so it's not really the Word of God. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> if you read the very first part, first chapter, first verse. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants those things which must soon come to pass. He sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Now everybody says, oh, revelation is written by John. So it's the revelation of John. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is Jesus Christ revealing it to John through one of his servants. But it was given to him by God the Father. So God the Father goes, hey, son, go tell John this. Right? And they are one and the same. So it's not like he's telling him and he's subservient. He knows. Jesus knows what God's on his mind because he is God and he's on the same. They're right next to each other on the, on the thrones. Right? So they send an angel. Right? What are angels? messengers and to do the will of God and to fulfill what needs to be done so an angel shows up to John and tells him this is what Father God told Jesus and he wants you to know this so he bore a record right a witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all the things that he saw, which tells you, one, he saw the angel, he listened to the angel, he was bearing witness to the word of God, right? Jesus is the word. And it also shows that Father God is expressing these things for him to write it down he bore witness to it he saw it he it was you know you have to have witnesses in order to collaborate a story otherwise it's called hearsay and so i noticed there's a witness to the word of god and to the testimony of jesus christ now where did we see that chapter five the souls of the saints under the altar who what? Kept the word of God and for the testimony of the Lamb, at which Jesus is the Lamb. Okay? Why was John put on the island of Patmos? Because he stood up for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, and he was punished and thrown on this island. So, The revelation is from Jesus. As our Father God to Jesus to the angel. Okay, that's the progression. So now I'm going to read 
I'll try and make this quick. Uh, the the parts where the church was good, the things that they were doing, that was Father's will. Okay. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. Now, this is all seven churches. That's what I did. I took all the seven angels and everything they said about Jesus and everything they said about the churches and all the bad things that they need to work on and then all the things that they can overcome. Okay? You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have been found liars or found them liars. You have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake. Whose name's sake? Jesus Christ. Yeshua HaMashiach, right? And have not become wary. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. I know you work your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. See, God's perspective is working the hardships and being poor here on earth. But in the spiritual world, he says you're rich. Why? Because they have patience and persevered, you know. Um, and I know the blasphemy, blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those which things which you are about to suffer. I know your works and where you dare dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and do not deny my faith. Whose faith? Not your faith. The faith that's given to you is actually Jesus' faith, right? It says, do not, you did not deny my faith. Even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, your patience, and as for your works, the last are more than the first. Now to you I say, to the rest of Thyriah, as many as do not have this doctrine, and we'll talk about this doctrine when we get there, which I think is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, um, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. So hold fast. Can you lose it? Well, you're holding on fast, right? Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Remember, therefore, where you have received and heard and hold fast. I know your works. See that I have set before you an open door. And this is Revelations 3, 10, 3, yeah, mm -hmm. Philadelphia. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have little strength and have kept my word. See, we're all kind of getting down to the end of the wire, getting tired, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet to know that I have loved you. Sounds like there's a little bit of a jealousy, envy, and a whole lot of lying. They say they're of the synagogue, they say they're Jews, but they're actually the synagogue of Satan. You know, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold to fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. So you got to hold fast again, right? And you need patience and love and perseverance. So he's coming at an hour of trial, which is coming on the whole world. So now we know that there's an event. It's going to happen in one hour. And if you read the Minor Prophets, it happens in one hour at noonday, right? In one hour, everything's going to change at noon. On the day of the Lord. Is this the day of the Lord when he comes back? Or is this when he comes to pull everybody out? You know? Because the second coming of Christ is when he destroys Satan. 
But he comes down before that in the clouds, and we meet him there. The dead in Christ rise first, and those who are alive change, you know, in the twinkling of an eye. So this next part is a part um, about all the things that need change. The warnings. Because I've talked about how cool Jesus is and all the things that he's done, right? And then there's a whole part about it talks about the good things, right? That the seven churches have done. Here comes the stuff that needs to get fixed or worked on. Things which must shortly take place. Even those who pierced him. This is when he shows up in the clouds, right? Every eye will see him. You'll understand all this stuff when, when I start reading the, the actual chapters. All the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. And when I saw him, I fell on my feet as dead. Oh, fell at his feet as dead. Which tells me, is this what's going to happen when all the eyes see him and the ones that mourn, they're going to fall down dead? Nonetheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. That seems like a conditional warning, that your lampstand will be pulled out unless you repent. But repentance is works? No, repentance is change of mind. You're reading this and going, oh, though my first works and my first love, who's your first love? You should love God with all your heart, and your mind, your soul, and your body, right? And love your neighbor as yourself. Those are two greatest commandments Jesus gave. The first one is to love God. And to love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. But he's saying to repent. And I think the word repentance is, is lost its real meaning in English in terms of like people say, oh, to repent, you got to turn away from sin. Yeah, you need to turn away from sin. It's a consent. Who is going to rule over you? God says you can only have one master, God or money. You can't serve two masters, right? So there's Satan or there's Jesus. And you're in the middle. You're born in the middle without the Holy Spirit and spiritually dead. Jesus made a way that he can have his spirit indwell you because there's you plus one. And you can open portable portals or opportunities for the evil side to come in. You can do it unknowingly. You can do it by consent. I mean, you're giving consent, but you don't know it. And see, the way things should work is, unless I say no, it means, unless I say yes, it means no. And if you notice on most um, agreements, when you install software or you go to a, a website, hey, we use cookies, you know, if you want to continue, go in. Or you can opt out of this, you know, but by default, you said yes, unless you go in and say, hey, no in my privacy settings. So you Satan's got it all worked out where it's like, well, you said yes. I didn't say anything. But, well, you didn't say no. So since you didn't say no, you obviously agree. Now, my grandfather always said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. You know, and that's your word, your bond. It's a matter of character, integrity, and pride. Not pride, but just mean what you say. Say what you mean. Don't lie. God says that. Don't lie. Now, since repenting is a change of mind, it's a matter of consenting. You say, Lord, Lord, because God says this. You say, Lord, Lord, but you don't obey my word. You don't do what I say. Which is why there's, at the judgment seat, in chapter 
19 of Revelations, where they say, well, didn't we cast out demons in your name, and didn't we do all these works, and didn't we do all this stuff in your name? It's Cain and Abel again, right? Didn't I do enough good stuff to make it? And that's what everybody thinks. If I'm just a good person, it'll outweigh the bad. No. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, I never knew you. How could he know you? By the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's the mystery. Is that our hope is that we will shine and be like him when he comes. The Holy Spirit's inside of us. And the Holy Spirit's pulled out before the Antichrist has come. Well, are you indwelled with the Holy Spirit? Or are you indwelled by something else? Otherwise, why would there be exorcists, you know, trying to exorcise demons? Because Jesus said, hey, you know, come out of them. And he said, what's your name? And he said, we are legion, for we are many. It's like, why, son of man, have you come to torment, torment us before our time? So they know that it's their time. He said, no. And they said, can you, you know, they asked permission um, of Jesus to give his consent that sent us in the pigs and they went off the cliff. And died. So not only can animals be possessed, so can people. And Jesus gave his consent and go. But they also knew that there was a time where judgment is coming. So let's go on. Um, Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. He gives us a time frame, ten days. Just like the 40 days of the flood, the 40 days of his trials and tribulation in the, in the wilderness, what Jesus went through, right? There's many different, you know, 40 years in the wilderness with Israel after they came out of Egypt. You know, they were tested. And now we have a number of 10. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak, to be a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you have also those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. Repent, or else I will come quickly, I will come to you quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Here he is again, saying, Repent. This is the kind of reason why I compiled this. Um, <clears throat> Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you have allowed the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to seduce and teach, or teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent. This is God's mercy and his long suffering, hoping that people will repent, will change their mind of following Lucifer in this world. And following Jesus. Or more to the point, who are you going to allow to run your life? Jesus through the Holy Spirit? Lucifer through everything in this world? Or possessed by spirits? Or are you in charge? Jesus said, give up your cross daily and follow me. What does that mean? Like in... Uh, was it Philippians, where it's like, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And it says to repent, to change your mind. Just like those bumper stickers that say, you know, dare, say no to drugs. Well, you can say no to sin. Your body is warring against your soul, and your soul is in the middle between the spirit and your flesh. Like an egg. There's the egg shell, the egg white, and the egg yolk. Right? The shell is this fleshly meat sack. You know, our soul of who we are, you know, is the yolk. The, I mean, the white, the egg white. But the yolk in the center is the holy of holies. And that's where the spirit lies. So why did Jesus die on the cross? Adam was perfect when he was created. And he fell. And he spiritually died, and then came the result of the physical death. So then, if Jesus is the light, and the Holy Spirit fills you with life, 
it's life eternal, life indeed. Okay? So, even though the body dies, the spirit lives on. Your soul, well, gets attached to Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit, like a seed inside of you, grows and fills your soul. Because that's the hole that everybody tries to fill. And you know what? All the money in the world, all the cars, the women, the men, whatever you're into, you know, even alcohol. You know, everybody's trying to fill that hole, that void. Because why? Because it was there because Adam and Eve sinned. And we were designed and created to have... Our soul plus one. The plus one is the spirit. Which spirits you want to entertain or you want to bow down to or follow, that's your choice. So we'll go on. Indeed, I have cast her into a sickbed, those who commit adultery with her into the great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. It's conditional, right? It's going to throw them into the tri great tribulation for more trials, testing, and 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 um, refinement, unless they repent of their deeds. If they turn away from doing evil, disobedience, they'll be saved. But that's works. Well, it says, unless they repent of their deeds, unless they turn away from doing these bad, evil things, they're going to get thrown in the Great Tribulation. It's gone. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he, I am he, who searches the minds and the hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Those are rewards, right? But he's searching your heart and your mind. Where your treasures are, there your heart will be. Don't put them here on earth where rust and moth and thieves can take them, but have your treasure in heaven. He says he's going to kill her children with death. Now, he said that, you know, I've read in the Old Testaments where it's talking about the kids are going to be taken and protected and saved from what's coming. Now, he says, I will kill her children with death. Well, he wants the spirit. He doesn't necessarily need the body. The body stays here in this world. The God is spirit. So he'll take the spirits. So, I also thought, well, if there's a rapture and everybody's taken, the dead in Christ will rise. Well, their bodies are in the ground, right? Decayed, gone, whatever else. And it's not just the ground. It's in the sea. You know, it's everywhere. And God will raise them up. The ones in Christ. The dead in Christ rise first. And then we who are alive are changed instantly. Now, I look at that and going, our DNA is unique to each one of us. So it's a blueprint, a roadmap. Can God resurrect us? He created Adam and Eve. He can definitely bring us back from the dead. He did it with Lazarus, right? Um, and us that are alive be changed in twinkling of an eye. Well, changing is something different from a fleshly garment to a heavenly garment, which could be a glorified body. That's why I see it, right? <clears throat> Go on. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come up upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I come upon you. Now, I've, I've already said, it's at noon, right, is when destruction comes. At one hour on that day. So watch. He's telling you, keep watch because I'm coming. So those are all the bad things that need to be fixed, you know, and it's fixed by repentance. So let's go on and say, what happens when you overcome? Because each one of these churches has said, hey, here I am. This is what I am. Here's the good things you've done. Here's the things that I don't like, right? You wanted a list of you know, how to, well, but then people say, well, these are only seven churches that were in Asia. And it's like, I think it applies to all the churches, you know, um, now. 
They all have different um, attributes, different gifts, but they all have things that are issues, except for the Church of Philadelphia, right? There is no repentance or needed for them. They are in good standing, it seems. So let's go on to the overcoming part. It says, a witness to the word and the testimony of Jesus Christ, right? Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keeps those things which are written in it, for the time is near. It says, you are blessed if you read the word. It's blessed if you hear the words of this prophecy. So the first part is the eyes are open to read and the ears are open to hear the word. Now, I think the Apostle Paul says, oh, how can they hear? You know, how can they know if they haven't been told? And that's the thing where Jesus said to go out and, and preach the gospel and tell the whole entire world, you know, so that everybody will know that there's an option of salvation. Let's go on. For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is John, right? Grace to you and peace from him. For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He says it three times, right? Three times the word of God and three times the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the saints that were under the altar in chapter 5. How, how were they given a white robe it's for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, in chapter 4, John, you know, heard. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet. Okay, and I put that in there for a reason because it says, first it says, in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit's indwelled in you, right? When did it happen? The Lord's day. The day of the Lord. And what did he do? He heard. What did he hear? He heard behind him a loud voice as a trumpet. Now, isn't that Jesus will come down in the clouds with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God? And call out, what? The dead will rise in Christ, and then us who are alive will be changed in a twinkling of an eye. Um, so then, at the end of each one of the, the spirits of the angels talking to the church, right? He gives a overcomer, kind of, this is what you get. So he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And that's in Revelations chapter 22. Um, but it says, if you overcome, right? And I always read this, and I'm like, oh, it's referring to Jesus, right? Because he overcame, right? But no, this is Jesus saying, I did overcome. Past tense. Here. Here's what you need to fix. This is what you need to do. And this is what happens as a result. He will give to eat the tree of life. But then in the Garden of Evil, Eden, and then, you know, we chose the wrong tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, instead of the tree of life. Yeah, oops, why? Satan tempt you? Well, Eve made a choice. So did Adam. Like I said, it's like contracts. Everything's run on contracts and agreements. You know, with witnesses to witness you agreeing to this or that or not. So stand up for Jesus. No matter un how unpopular it is. So be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. See, he repeats this over and over. Who has an ear, hear the Spirit. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. What's the second death? Being thrown in the lake of fire. Forever and ever and punished forever and ever. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's repeated. Okay? Because it's important. 
in Revelation 22. It says, what the Spirit and the Bride say, come, come to paradise, come and be with us. This is in the future. It hasn't happened yet. Now here, it says, to him who overcomes, I will give a stone of hidden manna, oh, to give some of the hidden manna to eat. Now, the manna was fell from heaven six days when the Israelites were in the wilderness. They had nothing to eat. So he provided the bread of life for them for six days. And on the seventh day, there wasn't any. So on the sixth day, they had to gather up twice as much to be ready to have for the seventh day because there wasn't going to be anything falling on the ground. So when he says to prepare to be ready, physically and spiritually, um, Joseph was in Egypt and there was a great famine in, in, uh, in Israel. And so, what happened? Um, they went down to Israel, the 11 brothers, and Joseph, with the technicolor coat, right? Um, he was put in charge. But he, what he told the Pharaoh is, take extra gain, grain and put it away and save it. For, while the seven years of plenty happens, because this was the Pharaoh's dream, a fat cow and a skinny cow, right? So that he put away and provided for when there was not a lot of food. He had food in the grain in the, in the storehouses that he could open up and keep people hungry and fed. <clears throat> because he thought ahead. So, they got to eat the hidden manna. right? And to him who overcomes, I will give to some of the hidden, man, the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on this stone a new name written, which no one knows except for him who receives it. And he who overcomes keeps my works until the end. And to him I will give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And this is part of Revelation 12, which I haven't gotten to yet. You know, and I always read that and thought, okay, it's Mary and Jesus. Mm, no, because Jesus already overcame. And he's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. But he's going to appoint kings and priests. Those are the ones that um, the second death has no um, power over. And we read about that in chapters uh, 5 and 6, about the saints that lost their life for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, or the Lamb. So, let's go on. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like potter's vessels. Now, we know there's two types of vessels. The potter made the one for mercy and the one for destruction. The mercy to show his love and the, and the ones for destruction to show his power and authority. As I have also received from my father. <clears throat> now, see, he received the rod of iron from his father. I will give to him the morning star. In Revelation chapter 22, he says, I am the bright and morning star, not Lucifer, Jesus. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall be clothed with white garments, which I think is a glorified body, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. So your name is written in the book of life, and he's not going to blot it out, which means this book of life has everybody's name in it, and some are blotted out, some aren't. Which ones are blotted out? Well, we know the vessels that were made for destruction are blotted out. Can the vessels of mercy be blotted out? I haven't found that out yet. You know, there's a group of people that say, once saved, always saved. And I see what scriptures are saying, that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. If we're indwelt with the Holy Spirit, we're sealed. But if you say, hey, you know, I said this prayer and then go back and sin and live your life just like how the devil wants you to. Have you really repented? Have you really changed your mind? Have you come out of the world? Are you still living in it? So, he's going to give you white garments, and I will not blot your, his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before the angels. So you stand for Jesus now. He will stand for you later, during the judgment. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to your churches. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar 
in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him a name of my God and the name of the city of my God and the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. So you will get to be in the new Jerusalem in the millennium or the new heaven and earth. Both. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Behold, I stand and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and him with me. He will come into you. This is the mystery. That the Holy Spirit can fill that void, that hole that you so desperately need. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I have also overcame. See? He did it already. These are the things that we will get if we are overcomers. The rewards. And sat down with my Father on his throne. He who has, a, has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I know this is going on. So then, I'm looking at the first chapter of the three. <clears throat> and it says at the bottom, the mystery. The mystery... There's seven spirits, <coughs> sorry, <clears throat> around the throne of God. There's, it says there's, how many churches are there? There's seven. Okay, how many lampstands? Well, there's seven. How many angels? There's seven. How many stars? There's seven. Okay, but when he explains the mystery at the very end, it says that the seven churches are the seven lampstands. They're one and the same. The seven stars that he was holding in his hand are seven angels. So that tells us that we know that the stars up there that you're looking at quite possibly are angels. Um, and it does say, the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven. Seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Okay? So now if you look at the menorah, wait, wait there's seven candlesticks yep okay and the one in the middle is Jesus I think that the one in the middle could be uh, the Church of Philadelphia but that's just my assumption so then I looked how many times did it say seven spirits actually wrote it in the book it happens one time one time the seven spirits are around the throne right there's three times that it's written about the seven churches. There's three times that it talks about the seven lampstands. And I'm actually counting the words, right? And how many times it says seven stars? There's three times that you see seven stars. Okay. Now, There's one of seven spirits. One in seven. Seventeen. Okay? There's three times seven churches. Three times seven? Twenty-one. How many time how how many days did Daniel fast? Twenty-one days. Okay? There's three sets of the seven stars, three sets of the seven lampstands. I know this is a little confusing, right? So then I'll go, okay, what's 3 plus 7? 10, which is the number of completion. If you take the 0 and read it backwards in Hebrew, it's 1. It's 0, 1. Okay? So then I thought, okay, there's three times I see 37. Okay? Okay? Three sets of seven churches, three sets of seven lampstands, three sets of seven stars or angels. That's 37. 37 times 3 is 111. That's 111. So how many 111s are there? There's three. Okay? And you, you can look at that and going, okay, there's 1 times 3. That's 13. That is the 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 
the love chapter again, right? So then I'm going, okay, um, 3 times 7 is 21. How many sets of 21 are there if you multiply each set of 3 and, and 7, right? That makes 21 times 3, which makes 63. Now, read that from right to left, or backwards, it's 36. 36 is the authority of the nail, which is Va. Okay? Jesus was crucified, started at 3, at the third watch, right? The sun went dark, there was a great earthquake, and it lasted for 3 hours. That was the sixth watch. So there's your 3 and your 6. I'm going to hold this up, and hopefully you guys can kind of... Wait, let me get it right. Up, up, up. Hold on. There you go. Okay, so that's kind of the number thing I saw. And that was just all embedded in that first chapter. So, we want to be overcomers. How do you be overcomers? turn away or repent or change your mind about doing sin, evil, and wickedness and living in this world. Easy? Absolutely not. No. But we have the Holy Spirit to convict us, to go, hey, hey, hey. You know, and you do, when you, the body wins the battle over the spirit and the soul, well, you can go to God and say, you know, through Jesus, I'm sorry, forgive me. That's repentance, to turn away. Should you keep doing it? No. Doesn't show true repentance. I'm growing, I'm learning, and I could be wrong. Take this to the Lord and ask for confirmation. Um, the next one I do, I'll actually just read through the word because I wanted to give you my explanation of what I saw and how it fits. And then... Now that you've heard me say the breakdown of what the spirits have said to the seven churches and what they need to do and what they will receive by being an overcomer. So what's the moral of the story? Turn from evil, accept Jesus, accept him into your heart, Give permission or consent. Basically, it's like, not me, but you, God. And you fill me with your Holy Spirit, and you lead me, and you use me, and I'm a willing vessel. And get your will done through me. And accept the, the sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross. Because it says it. He was alive, he died, and he rose again. And he sat at the right hand of his father. He overcame. And because he has, he gives us the opportunity to accept his free gift and his sacrifice. He shed his blood as an innocent lamb, as an innocent man, to pay the price for what Adam did. So that you can have God inside of you. And that you can be with God in heaven forever and ever. But the choice is yours. You decide. God's not going to force you, but if you don't choose him, he said, and this is what Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. So there's no middle ground, which is what we read in um, the, the seals. Being, being neither hot nor cold. You know. So today is the day to choose. Choose Jesus, choose life, and love you guys.